Jane by Shelley Deweese. Now I think I did intrigue a fair amount of people in my Friday Reads video when I talked about how much I was disliking this book. Uh, I have so many things to say about this book, so I'm going to try to be concise and keep this as brief as I can. Uh, the first thing that I will say is the quality of writing in this was excellent, so I, I want to, you know, get that out of the way, first of all, in case anybody thought I was critiquing the actual writing. Um, then, you know, just just know the quality of the writing was pretty dynamic. I thought it was, uh, felt, you know, very... Um, personal for a nonfiction, and uh, I was impressed by it. So just in case you don't remember the tagline, it is rediscovering seven amazing women writers who transformed British literature. So basically her mission in this was to uh, bring to the public eye more women authors uh, from basically the Victorian era that were underappreciated and underrepresented that she thinks should be, and I think she's kind of hoping that there will be a sort of uh, revival of these underappreciated Victorian authoresses and that maybe this book would bring more awareness to them. So I do appreciate that mission and I do think uh, it's really sad to think that there are probably just hundreds upon hundreds of forgotten authors that have just slipped through the cracks and that we just might never read because we didn't know about them. They aren't just well that, that well known and you know Jane Austen uh, has been given so much uh, more of a boost from the miniseries that came out. More people, that's how a lot of people find out about her. That's how I found out about her. So it's just, um, I understand and I understand and really respect her mission in doing that. So there's seven different authors in here. Uh, now there's two parts to what I didn't like about this. The, the first part is that as a goal in this book, she has basically that these women are all role models. She talked more about their lives kind of than I wanted to hear and I wanted to hear more about their books. Uh, when she talked about the books, she did basically a plot summary and gave away tons of spoilers. So I would kind of have to find myself skimming a lot during the plots because in the ones that I was interested in, I didn't want to know the ending in advance. And so I wish she had talked more about uh, the sort of themes that they had and the um, like the narrative style, that sort of thing, more literary criticism where she's just giving a plot synopsis for each of them and a lot of them I, I couldn't finish. Uh, in addition to that, many of the women in here that she puts on this pedestal as role models, I would not consider role models. So out of the seven women in here, there were only two whose lives I really felt like I could look up to as a role model. And the first, and it was kind of bookends in the book, uh, the first one was Charlotte Turner Smith. She's the first author she talks about. And then um, authors two, three, four, and five, Helen Maria Williams, Mary Robinson, Catherine Crow, Sarah Coleridge, uh, had lives that I really wouldn't want to embody myself. And then author six, Dinah Mullet Crake, who I'm very excited to investigate. So she was kind of the hidden gem to me in this book. And then the seventh was Mary Elizabeth Braddon, who has a very notorious life. So, and she wrote Lady Audley's Secret. So that really uh, set me off on a bad note for this book. And I, I just, I think there are certain branches of feminism that are more... Um, aggressive and this book just felt incredibly negative about men. I think you can still be uplifting to women without tearing down men. I don't think it has to be one or the other and this really felt uh, blaming kind of all problems on men and that you know if women ruled the world we, we wouldn't have any problems and I just think that's not the case and I think men have done so many great things so I think you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater if there were lots of hardships for women then but um, life is just hard in general, I, I think. And, and just the way that she talked about them, it was just very off-putting to me. And really, honestly, I thought it had a double standard for women. So in uh, one of the first authors, we hear about how they were in dire straits financially because the father up and left and went with a mistress, which is totally, uh, you know, I think that's very wrong just to abandon your family. But then later on, one of the authors who she's talking about, who's this great role model, um, was a mistress of someone who had children. And so to me, that's such this double standard that, well, you know, she's really just being this free woman, but why was the mistress of the author's father 
such a, a bad person. So it, it just this kind of double standard that, you know, men are reprehensible if they uh, don't show fidelity, but women um, are just being free. And then another instance where she was talking about uh, an author who was separated from her husband and she was living with another man. And then she goes to the theater to see a play and sees her husband there with another woman and just yells and makes a public scene when she herself was not even on good terms with him. She was living with someone else, but apparently he's not able to do that. I just think there was really a double standard and she just seemed very harsh on men. It just seemed very antagonistic. In addition to that, it was very negative on um having children. It views um, having children as a kind of slavery. And I do think you definitely have to be selfless if you are going to have children. But I think one of the most effective things you can do as a human being is have, other, you know, raise other human beings who are kind and good and nice. And that's something that I think Shelley DeWeese, the author, just totally doesn't see. And, uh, you know, as a on a practical note, I also think who's going to take care of you when you're old if you don't have children? Um, so I just think that her personal views were just too preachy in this. She was very, uh, just, it, it just banging it over my head that like these women were such free spirits. Isn't that so great? Um, so it just really, it was very bothersome to me. And then, uh, there was one author that she talked about how wasn't it so great that she abandoned her children for several months because she wrote this amazing novel that she wouldn't have been able to write was she taking care of them. And the same author, it was really, really upsetting to me. Like this is a woman who has servants and she only has to be around her children a couple hours in a day. And she was getting to write all the other times. She only has to be around her children a couple hours in a day. And it, it said like it physically pained her to be around her children those, those couple of hours. Um, and just to be around your kids a couple hours a day was like that upsetting to you. And so then she just goes and abandons her family and lives in a hotel for a couple months. And Shelley Deweese makes her look like this hero of literature because now she wrote this amazing work that we can all have when she's just like totally not concerned about her children and their welfare and how they were doing in that time. So that just really bothered me. Um, her personal beliefs being so preachy in this. Now, the other part that was disappointing to me, this was disappointing as opposed to upsetting, which is what I was just talking about. What was disappointing to me was the women that she picked that were important are not my style of reading. So I've talked before about how I don't really enjoy The Tenet of Wildfell Hall, just because I think it's basically social commentary masked as a novel. Like I feel like there's very little plot and it's just really commentary on rights of women in the Victorian era. So if that's your speed, um, the types of novels that she recommends in this, you will really enjoy. And I basically knew, I, I knew I was probably not going to find a whole lot of women that I liked in this within one of the opening paragraphs in her introduction. She says, this book, however, is not meant to diminish the fantasy that many of us take away from the fiction of Jean and Charlotte and Emily Bronte or trivialize the pleasure we find in it. Their romanticized and sentimental Englands, not always ideal lands, but on the whole less agitating to live in than our own, are just as necessary as ever, for they still, still speak to us and tap into our emotional yearnings in a way few others can. However, this project has given me an entirely new appreciation for the women of British literature. My view is wider, my bookshelves are fuller, my awareness of history is keener. So as we soldier into the unknown, dear reader, fear not that Jane and Charlotte and Emily and the rest of the gang will lose their magic. Their world, the whole lovely landscape of it, will be waiting for you when you get back. So the fact that she says that about the Brontes and Jane Austen, their romanticized and sentimental Englands, I, I don't really think of... Uh, the Brontes definitely not sentimental uh, England. I, I don't think of them as that. They, to me, show very hard lives and very bleak settings. I think Jane Austen, you could argue that more, but she has very flesh and blood, real feeling characters. Like, I feel th those characters, to me, um, Marianne Dashwood, Eleanor Dashwood, Emma Woodhouse, feel so real to me. They don't feel caricature. And so I think she's more talking about the 
so the economic status of the characters. And I do think it is refreshing in Elizabeth Gaskell's works that there are more people who are middle class and, you know, working to make their way in the world. But I still wouldn't say that Jane Austen is sentimental. So I, I, I think maybe it's her misinterpretation of Jane Austen. But then moving on, so, you know, the, the authors, it's all, if you like The Tenet of Wildfell Hall, I think you will like many of these authors. They use, you know, a novel as an excuse to write social commentary. Some of them wrote essays. Uh, one of them was very pro-French Revolution, and she lived in France at the time of one of the revolutions, and, um, you know, wrote a lot about that. So lots of essays and poetry in addition to novels, and I really am a novel reader, and I like, um, more like Jane Austen style plots, Elizabeth Gaskell style plots. So I, you know, and I like some of the Brontes. I love Jane Eyre. I love um, Wuthering Heights. Uh, but then on a, you know, on a different note, I really like Jane Austen, but I don't really like Mansfield Park as much. And her novel feels more like social commentary masked as a novel. But a big positive that came from this is I learned about Dinah Mullock Craig. Uh, author number six in this, and I'm very, very excited about this author. She had a very sweet story. She uh, grew up in a family where um, they were like, you know, you have to get married, you have to marry yourself off, and she did not want to marry a man that she couldn't respect. And so she was single uh, for a long time and supported herself with her pen. And then when she, around when she was 40, she met George Crake, and they fell like hopelessly in love. He was injured in an accident. There are really conflicting stories about what actually happened to him, but basically he was um, wheelchair bound and she nursed him in that time and he fell totally in love with her. I think she was about 15 years older than him and she was so in love with him and they were not able to have biological children of their own, but someone left a baby on their doorstep and in the middle of winter and she found the baby and you know kept this baby healthy and the baby thrived and was her daughter Dorothy and so she just ha ended up having a very sweet story and she had a life that I like really was like okay you are awesome uh, and one thing she said she wrote an essay before any of her novels she wrote a women a woman's thoughts about women she said we must help ourselves by the full exercise of every faculty physical moral and intellectual in doing so a young woman would discover her inner fortitude and the power of her being with or without a husband and become a paradigm of modern womanliness foot sore and smirched but never tainted exposed doubtless to many trials yet never yet never either degraded or humiliated young girls trust yourselves rely on yourselves so to me that is a like much more eloquent picture of what it means to be a strong woman that you shouldn't just be pining away for a man to complete you and you can still be a strong woman but you don't have to be this um woman that kind of just only cares for yourself Another aspect of Dinah Mullet Creek that sounds really fun is her men and her novels sound like they might be similar to uh, Elizabeth Gaskell's men and that they are working men. And for those of you that have read North and South, John Thornton like pulled himself up by his bootstraps, which was really new in the Victorian era, but it was a new class of men. And so she talks about this big event that called the Great Exhibition. Together, these men and women represented the new middle class, a group with a healthy commitment to industry, and who, by taking risks, a conservative aristocrat might have passed up in favor of the status quo, would shortly come to dominate the English economy. Here at the Great Exhibition, they were also an embodiment of the social upheaval that had shaken up the marriage market. Aristocratic roots no longer automatically equated to financial success. Instead, power is transferring from the landovers to the makers and distributors. Farmers, bankers, merchants, manufacturers, and the myth of the middle class upstart was born. So I think that's really exciting because I do like that about the, you know, Elizabeth Gaskell's male characters, that they were working men and really active and philanthropists. And so if she has male characters like that, I really want to investigate her more. And it also says that she was a friend to Elizabeth Gaskell. So I think that would be a good avenue for me to find, you know, authors that Jane Austen liked or authors that Elizabeth Gaskell liked rather than, um, 
you know, maybe someone who has different literary tastes than I do. Then there is a letter that is a quote from her to her friend speaking after she's married. And it says, when people are happily married, they are so very happy. I never alter my creed that a single woman may be perfectly happy in herself if she chooses, and that the single life is far better than any but the very happiest married life. But oh, we are so happy. Just so cute. Oh, so cute. And I just really appreciate that. That she's saying, like, you shouldn't just get married just because society says you should get married. Um, that you can be happy in yourself. You shouldn't depend on a man. But if you find a man who makes you happy, that's, like, really exciting. And I really appreciated that. I thought that was really refreshing. Uh, and then she says about her daughter, she, uh, that... Her creative output was reduced during Dorothy's infancy, but Dinah didn't mind. Her new responsibilities were, quote, 20,000 times better than writing. So I think that's really sweet. Another thing about Dinah Craig that, you know, uh, Shelley DeWeese uses as a criticism of her, but to me was a positive. She says, Dinah Craig always wrote directly to a middle class audience. George Eliot said that her readers were novel readers, pure and simple. So I was like, that is me, a novel reader, pure and simple. And uh, then Dinah Craig said, for this, um, I am unapologetic. The mill on the floss and others like it, she responded, might be as perfect as the novel can well be made, but what good will it do? Ask whether it will lighten any burdened heart, help any perplexed spirit, comfort the sorrowful, succor the tempted, or bring back the earring into the way of peace. And what is the answer? Silence. It had to be acknowledged that women were whole people, that their selfless poise and delicacy were in many cases merely a polished exoskeleton built to protect their inner workings from scrutiny and the outside world from the potential explosiveness of female frustration. So I also think Shelley DeWeese, um, her like reason for reading is very different than mine. Hers is more, um, you know, she's studying and literary criticism, whereas my reading, my novel reading, is to kind of be swept away. So when I read The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, I'm just mad. I'm just mad at the characters when I read it, but when I read something like Wives and Daughters, I'm swept away and just so excited about reading. So I think all in all that I just had a different idea of what this was going to be. It's still well written, and like I said, if you like more Victorian literature, that social commentary, you will enjoy this. And I had a lot to say about this book, so I do apologize for the length of the review, the review, but I wanted to give it, you know, the amount of commentary that I had on it. And I would be interested in respectful discussion down below, and let me know what you think, and I will see you guys for another video soon. Bye!